Uh, just want to introduce myself first and foremost. My name is Jared. I'm the pastor here at Highland City. So thank y'all for being here this morning and, and for uh, getting out in the cold weather this morning. I'm just kidding. Felt amazing. I was loving it. Um, but uh, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Mark chapter four. And we're going to be going through the book of Mark as we continue on this series. And last week. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this. So last week, we looked at just Mark chapter 1. That's all we had time for. And in Mark chapter 1, we see that Jesus embraces his role because John the Baptist prepared the way. Jesus then was baptized. Then he went into the wilderness, and then he came back, and he preached his very first sermon on repentance and believing. And then after that, he goes and he, he is very intentional in his disciple making. And he goes to the shores of the Sea of Galilee and he finds four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And then he calls them from that, says, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So he meets them where they're at using lingo that they would understand, connects them to the gospel in this case. And then he invites them to follow. And what does it say that they do? They drop their nets immediately and follow him. And so what we're going to be talking about today is actually we're going to be going through Mark chapter 2 through 4, but I wanted to start with this, because we're going to be starting with the parable of the seed and the sower and ending with the parable of the seed and the sower. Some of you might be familiar with this passage, but I want to read it nonetheless to reacquaint all of us. Let's go ahead and read it, verse 3, uh, going through verse 8 at first, chapter 4. Listen, this is Jesus telling a parable. A farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on, on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. The other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Still, other seeds fell on fertile soil. And they sprouted, grew, produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as they planted. And so what we see here is these four different classifications of fields, if you will. These four different fields. But let's go to the next, uh, skip down. The disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, what does this mean? You're speaking in parables. This is, you're speaking Greek to us. And so then he explains the parable. Let's look at verse 14. The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. So the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message, only to have Satan come, like the birds, at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing in God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things. So no fruit is produced. And lastly, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. What I want to point out here. And you know, a quick story first. So when I was growing up, my dad was a pastor. And I remember there's this one Sunday morning where the worship team, they were practicing. And, and I remember thinking, and I was, I don't know, probably eight or 10, somewhere around that age. And I remember thinking, man, what an easy ticket into heaven is just to serve, just to be a pastor, be a worship leader. Because the, the lady that was a worship leader at the time, her name was Stacy. And I remember thinking, man, she's got a free ticket into heaven because she's, she's singing about Jesus on Sunday mornings. And that couldn't be further from the truth, by the way. Um, the idea of like working to get into heaven, that's not how it works. That's just not how this grace thing works. But that's the thought that I had. And I know if I had that thought, then maybe others think that as well. Just because I'm a pastor, it's not like an easy ticket to heaven. It's by grace through faith that we're saved. It's not because of what I'm doing, right? And so I wanted to clarify that. But when we read this parable, we, we tend to separate it into our own minds of, of you've got, okay, you've got the, the three different groups of people, the three different soils that ultimately they received the word as Jesus explained, but then they ultimately ended up not producing a harvest for whatever reason. Maybe it was the birds, maybe it was the rock, maybe it was the thorns. Whatever reason, they didn't produce a harvest. And then you've got the, the Christians over here, the ones that do hear the word, and then they embrace it, they're in for, fertile soil, and so then they grow and they, they thrive, they produce a harvest. And as Christians, we tend to categorize things. And so when I think of a Christian, many of you probably too at one point, 
when I think of a Christian, I tend to put them into different categories, much like I did when I was a kid. I said, oh, they're a worship leader, a pastor, the people that do the work of the faith. He said, uh uh-uh, uh, because he's right. It's not that. When we actually read this parable, every single individual that was planted, the seeds that was planted in fertile soil, every single one of them produced a harvest of 30, 60, or 100 times. It wasn't that there was there's some seeds that expected the other seeds to produce all the work. That's not how it works. That's not the parable. That's not what Jesus is teaching. The other thing that I think about when I read this passage is that I want to clarify is that a disciple will produce a harvest. Again, we, we, think of, we think of unsaved and saved. But when we look at this parable, there's three groups that are unsaved and one group that is saved. The, the people that, that hear the word of God, they embrace it, but whatever it is that happens in life, it chokes them out. The, the worries of this world, the lure of wealth, as Jesus describes, there's these three different classifications. Uh, either the devil snatched them up like the birds, the, the, the rock stopped them from growing, and the sun wilted them, or maybe it was the thorns that, as they grew, choked them out. There's those three groups of people, but nonetheless, they heard the word, they heard the gospel, and for whatever reason, ultimately rejected it. And then there's the one group, that they do produce fruit. When we have these, these two different ideas, these classifications of saved and unsaved, it's disciple and everybody else. That's right. Every single one of us are called to be priests, uh, to, to, are called to be disciples. And according to this passage, the disciple will produce a harvest. They will produce a fruit. And it's so, so cool how, like Jessica, when she came up here, by the way, we don't coordinate our messages by any means. But it's so cool how the Holy Spirit works because they always seem to go hand in hand. She's talking about fruitfulness, and that's precisely what we're talking about today with the parable of the seed and the sower with fruitfulness. As, as disciples, we will produce fruit. Not that we should, not that some disciples should, but all disciples all right. will produce fruit. And if you don't produce fruit, much like how she talked about Matthew chapter 7, if you don't produce fruit, then are you really a disciple? We have in this, this uh, we're in the Bible Belt, obviously, if you didn't know that. And so we live in a, a, a culture that a lot of people, a lot of pastors call it cultural Christianity. And it's because we're raised in a Christian environment, so we think that we're Christian. And it's really dangerous. It's dangerous primarily for two reasons. One is it gives a false sense of security. Oh, my grandma, she was raised in church. She, taught, she took me to church. I went to VBS. I did the Awana stuff. I did that. Uh, I said a prayer and ready to rock and roll, moving and grooving, even though, you know, my whole life is a rejection of Christ. Titus chapter 1 says, you, you profess me with your mouth, but you deny me by your actions. Actions speak louder than words. First John chapter 3 verse 19 says that um, your actions show that you belong to the truth. So I say that to say that it creates this false sense of security because you can say a prayer when you're four years old, but if you don't give your life to Jesus, we have this phrase of, oh, I gave my life to Jesus when I was eight years old. I, I believe and was baptized and said a prayer, but your life rejected him. I'm sorry to say it, but where's the fruit? What I would classify that individual as was somebody that was raised in the church. They grew up and then the thorns choked them out. The weight of this world, the lures of this world, it choked them out. And it's a hard message today, by the way. I asked, <laughs> you hear the, the kids' music? I asked, I asked Jenna, I, I said, because uh, I, I don't ever want to not preach hard things. So I, if you know me, like if you have a hard question, that's where I thrive. I love the hard questions. Um, but I, I, I asked her some questions. She's like, don't even worry about it. Don't, don't go with that, that easier sermon. She said, go for the harder one. So we're, we're going for it. Um, and so we're talking about the parable of the seed and the sower. The first thing I said about why this cultural Christianity is so dangerous, again, it creates this false sense of security. The second thing is that onlookers, people who are not Christian, people who are not saved, they look at these cultural Christians, and it gives Christianity, true Christianity, a bad rap. Yeah, no. And so when these non-Christians look at Christianity, they see these, I'm going to call them cultural Christians, people that truly don't live out their faith, that are not disciples, people that are a Christian by title, but not by lifestyle. They look at these Christians, and they say, oh, they're hypocrites. Have y'all heard that about the church? Yes. yes. And it's because of this cultural Christianity that people have this idea of uh, how bad and how poor Christians are. But in reality, a true Christian 
is not going to lead them in that same direction. They're not going to allow for these other conclusions. Give you an example. So uh, if you were to look at the history of Christianity and the impact it's had on the world, we have orphanages because of Christianity. More people get fed annually because of Christianity. There's tons of fruit that is evidence of Christianity. Now, the reason I say that uh, cultural Christianity it gives a bad rap for Christians is because these people look at these Christians, Christians by title, not by lifestyle, and they say, why would I want to be a part of that? And so they never even begin to study the faith for themselves, these people that are studying Christianity. They never study it for themselves because these fake Christians, these cultural Christians, give it a bad rap. This is where my heart is burdened, church. And please hear me. And I've shared this before, and I want to share it again. When we were deciding, my wife and I, on what I say we were deciding, we were seeking the Holy Spirit as to where we wanted to start a church or where God wanted us to start a church. And, and we were looking elsewhere for tons of different reasons, story for another day, another time. Come to next steps. Um, <laughs> little plug there. Um, but no, we were searching and we were praying and fasting. And anyways, long story short. In figuring out where we wanted to plant, I did not want to plant in Georgia. Uh, there was conversations being had. Anyways, there's, especially in LJ where there's a church every quarter mile, we didn't want to plant here because of that. Uh, we wanted to go to this new field, to this new area where things, uh, where people hadn't heard the name of Jesus before. Yet God called us to LJ, Georgia, where there's a church every quarter of a mile, where everybody here is claiming to be a Christian. So God called me to, to, to pastor in an area where it, seemingly everybody is a Christian. And it wasn't until after we moved here that he gave me this story, this analogy, and it's like being lost in the desert. If you know that you're lost in the desert, then at least you can find your way out, or at least begin to try to find your way out. But if you're lost in the desert and you don't know that you're lost, then what hope do you have? And the reason that God gave me that, I, I, I fear, is that in the Bible Belt, we are living amongst a nation, for lack of better terms, a people that are lost in the desert that don't know that they're lost. The people that we see that as we go to Walmart, the people that are in our family, the people that we interact with on a daily basis, these are people that are lost in the desert without hope because they don't know that they're lost because of cultural Christianity. Let's look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. And this is the theme verse throughout this entire series. And I know we're going through Mark, yet I'm quoting Matthew. Uh, Matthew or Mark has it in chapter 16, but this is more in-depth, so I want to quote it. Therefore, what? Go. Go. And make what? Disciples. Of all nations, baptizing them. Hold on, hold on. I want to back up. I want to back up. We're talking about being, bearing fruit, the, the parable of the seed and the sower. Therefore, go, fruit, and make disciples, fruit of all the nations baptizing fruit them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit teach fruit these new disciples to obey fruit all the commands that i've given you and be sure of this and other translations would say and remember fruit i am with you always even to the end of the age in other words trust trust is fruit now jessica was talking about the fruit of the spirit love joy Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those nine fruits of, fruits of the Spirit, they are what play into the fruits that I just highlighted in Matthew 28. It's the fruits of the Spirit that then, from the outpouring of that, see a visible outgrowth, a visible harvest, if you will. When you see these, these people becoming pastors, you see these people uh, leading worship, you see these people going and evangelizing, you see these people teaching, you see these people baptizing, that is the, the physical evidence of the spiritual fruit in their life. With that, I want to recap the Gospel of Mark, because we're, again, we're looking at the Gospel of Mark with this lens, with this view of discipleship. And in chapter 1, again, we see Jesus meet these fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and he invited them to follow him as he went on the mission. But if you got your Bibles, I know you had it a second ago, we were in chapter 4, flip back to chapter 2. And now we're going to go through this. And I want to show you how Jesus is discipling these people. Now, why does it matter? The reason we just read this verse of, of go and make disciples is because every single one of us are called to make disciples. Every single one of us. All of us, according to the parable of the seed and the sower, all of us, if we are saved, if we are disciples, 
because they're synonymous. Disciple and saved, they're the same. It's not those who are saved and then some of them are disciples. It is every single of the saved are disciples. So you have to first be disciple before you can then build disciples. That's exactly what Jesus is demonstrating to his disciples. If you don't know what a disciple is, it's just basically a student. If I say a disciple maker, a discipler, I'm just referring to the mentor or the teacher, if you will. Something neat is Luke chapter 6, verse 40. I quoted it last week, I'm going to quote it again. It's not going to be up on the screen. But it says, a student cannot be greater than their teacher, but once they are fully trained, they will become like their teacher. And so we, being disciples of Jesus Christ, can never be greater than Jesus. By no means, that would be heresy. We can never be greater than Jesus, but we can become like him. That's why we strive to be like him. We strive to image him. We strive to imitate him. 1 John 2, 6. Those who claim to be of Christ ought to walk as he walked, ought to live as he lived, some translations say. But let's look at uh, Mark chapter 2. If you see it, go ahead and pull up uh, chapter 2, verse 5. I want to actually talk about what's going on here, give a little bit of context. So in Mark chapter 5, or sorry, chapter 2, uh, right before verse 5, we see that this paralyzed man is lowered down through the roof so that uh, his friends lower this paralyzed man down to Jesus. And what's so interesting about this is that Jesus, of course, healed him. He was, he was going through, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say a phase, just for back, lack of better terms. But Jesus was very intentional in healing individuals and casting out demons at this point in his ministry because it was showing people that he was, at the very least, of God. Now, we know Jesus is God, but these Jews that he was performing these miracles for, they didn't know that at the time. So at the very least, it was showing that he was of God, that he at least was a prophet of God. And we actually, I would argue, that in this very passage, we see that he is God, because only God has the power to forgive sins, and that's exactly what they accuse him of. So this man that's lowered down through the roof, Jesus heals him, and then what does he say in verse 5? Seeing their faith, seeing the friend's faith. That's why it's important to have a good community of friends around you. you wanna, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians uh, that bad company corrupts good character. So associate yourself with good company so that you can then have friends that help your faith, right? Help lead you to Jesus. Seeing their faith, the friend's faith. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. What I want to point out here is that no obstacle stopped these friends from bringing this man to Jesus. There was a roof in the way. And they said, pow, pow. they ripped that thing apart so they could drop their friend in there. Are, you, are your friends willing to do the same thing? You know, are they even willing to, to drive two hours to see you, you know? Oh, that's rough. Associate yourself with friends that will help lead you to Jesus, not steer you away from him. Now, what I also want to point out with this is that discipleship requires perseverance and creativity. It's not a cut and paste mold. Now, what I also want to point out with this, notice how it says Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Excuse me? He didn't say get up and walk first thing. He addressed the spiritual issue. He addressed the heart. He addressed the sin. Disciple makers, disciplers that are in this room, which we are all called to eventually be, focus on the spiritual transformation. This shows here that discipleship goes so much deeper than just a surface level change. Jesus could have said, get up and walk immediately. He could have, but the root issue wouldn't have been addressed. So as disciple makers, we should be addressing the root cause when somebody's describing the problems that they're having in their life, the, the uh, for lack of better terms, the powers and principalities of the unseen world and how they're going through these spiritual attacks in their life, and they're, they're seeing all these things, like this the depression, this anxiety, oh, all this uh, uh, abuse, all this addiction. When you have somebody come to you portraying these problems, there's a deeper issue. There's a spiritual issue at hand. It's not just a physical uh, ailment that you're trying to, to tackle. It's a spiritual issue. Focus on the spiritual transformation. Focus on the heart of the issue, which is their heart. Now, what we continue to go on and see in Mark chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles, you can read on a little bit. We actually see Jesus call a man named Ma uh, sorry, Levi, who we later know as Matthew. Levi was a tax collector. How many of you like paying your taxes? No hands? Oh, man, that's such a shocker. Just kidding. 
So what would happen in this day and age, they would have tax collectors. They'd have people go door to door. See, we have just do it online. So you don't have a face to associate with the people that's, that's collecting the money that you owe the government. But imagine you had somebody come to your door saying, hey, it's time to pay your taxes. If it was the same person for all of us, I'm going to tell you this right now. A lot of us would have bad feelings for that man, right? <laughs> collecting those taxes. And that's exactly what was happening in this day and age. They had somebody walking around collecting taxes. His name was Levi. Jesus sees Levi and he calls him. He says, come and follow me. Levi then says, okay. <laughs> and so then he actually invites him over to his, his house for dinner. And not only is it Jesus, his disciples, and, and Levi, it's also a bunch of other, as the Bible calls, disreputable sinners. This, <laughs> this last Tuesday, uh, I'm, play, I'm, I'm playing co-ed softball. And any softball players in here? Any, like, anything? Like, okay, no, just me. That's fine. So uh, anyways, I, I didn't know anything about this team, and, and I go on the, the Gilmer County Facebook softball group, and, and I say, hey, I'm looking for a team. So this team picked me up. And anyways, during the game, they, they're playing music, and, and I don't know the name of the song. Maybe y'all do, uh, but it's, it's something like Californication, something like that. So we're talking about fornication, but California. Anyways, and, uh, and I'm thinking, man, I'm wearing a big old Highland City t-shirt. I announced to the umpire that I was a pastor. Everybody heard my conversation with the umpire uh, before the game about how I was a pastor. That's there on the side of the dugout. I'm thinking, man, people know that Pastor Highland City Church is, is hanging out with a bunch of fornicated and, uh, song type things. And, and uh, I was instantly wrought with conviction because that's just the spirit of legalism. And I was reminded, actually, and in fact, we'll cover it in just a moment, but Let's go ahead and pull up that verse, um, Mark chapter uh, 2, verse 17. The Pharisees approach Jesus, and they're saying, why are you associating yourself with such sinners? And Jesus heard this, and he told them, the Pharisees, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. So in retrospect, that's the best team that I can be on, Right? to be the shining light, the city on the hill, the salt of the earth. What I want to point out with this passage, and not only that, and that we should strive to be in this world but not of this world, uh, what I also want to point out is that each and every one of us just strive to get out of this church bubble. It's great. Fellowship is fantastic. We need to be in fellowship. We need to be in community. But if we are wrapping ourselves in this bubble, then we're never getting out. We're never reaching those who need to be reached. Something interesting about this passage is he says, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. What are you doing to reach the sick people? And I'm not just talking about the physically sick, while that is included. I'm talking about those, for example, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give them rest. What are you doing to reach the people that are carrying heavy burdens? What are you doing to, to reach the people that are weary? What are you doing to reach the people that would most benefit from hearing the gospel? Jesus warns us elsewhere in Scripture. He says that it, uh, it's warning of the, the perils of being rich. He says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. Do you know why it is so dangerous to have those riches? It's not, it's not bad to be rich. Uh, Paul writes that uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not bad to have money. It is bad to love the money. Do you know why it is uh, warned against of being rich? The reason Jesus warned against it is because what we see in this country is that when you have a need, we run to money. When we have a need, oh, I need a house. Here's money to buy a house. Here's money to rent a house. Oh, I need food. Here's money to buy food. When you have money, you don't need to rely on God. The reason that, that money is warned against, or the love of money, I should say, is warned against, is because when we rely on something outside of God, it places our heart in a different position. And so these rich individuals, as he's warning against, it's a warning because they're, they're showing that they're relying on something else outside of God. And so the reason that he's saying to, to target who we're speaking, uh, to, to target the, uh, he says, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. The reason we should be intentional with who we are spreading the gospel to is because if I were to spread the gospel to a rich man who feels that they have every need of their own and that Jesus can't provide any other kind of need, then it's going to fall on closed ears. He wants us to go to the people that would be receptive. The, the, he wants us to go to people that realize they have a need that Jesus can fulfill. I could go to a hundred folks that, that feel like they have all their needs met, 
Or I could go to 100 folks that feel like they don't have their needs met. And I'll tell you this, the response from the group of people that don't have their needs met are, is going to be far greater in response to accepting the gospel than it is the people that feel that they have their needs met. Does that make sense? There's a reason that when we're sharing the gospel, we, we target the individuals that need help because they can rely on God. But if we target the people that don't need help, then they're going to, what good is that going to do? So he's saying that healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. I've had a lot of conversations with, uh, with non-believers in my past, and, and I hear oftentimes, well, I'm a good person. Haven't y'all ever heard that before? Oh, yeah. I'm a good person. No, you're not. It's the good people. Jesus says, no one is good but God alone. If somebody thinks they're good, then they don't need to be made right in God's sight. But when I talk to individuals that know that they are flawed, that everything, they'll say, Jared, everything I do, it just doesn't work out. I'm a failure. I'm flawed. I'm chronically depressed. The people that know that they are flawed recognize their need for a savior. But those who know they are sinners are those that he's calling. He's not calling those who think they're righteous because it's going to fall on, on closed ears. Let's keep reading. Let's look at Mark chapter 3. And in this passage, I want to look at uh, verse 14 through 15. Let's go ahead and give that a read. So this is Jesus as he's continuing going on. Earlier, I actually mentioned in chapter 1, Jesus denied some people that were trying to get him to heal and, and all this fun stuff to feed him. He denied that so that he could pursue the mission. He was mission-minded. That was the point of, of last week's service. What we see here is that he was on the mission to recruit the rest of the twelve. Because he knows the importance of discipleship, the impact it can have. And then in chapter 3, verse 14, 15, then he appointed the 12 of them. What I want to point out, actually, if you look at verse 13, y'all don't have to pull it up, but he says he goes up on a mountain. Let me set the stage for y'all. How many of you would hike up a mountain with me if you knew that I would give you some kind of like Bible study at the top? I'm going to be honest with you. Y'all are fantastic. But you're like, ah, I'll stay home. So anyways, the reason I say that is because the disciples, he walked up the mountain to see who said, oh, he's worthy to follow. And then of the people that followed him, he appointed the rest of the 12. Then he appointed them and called them his apostles. They were to accompany him. Other translations say, and they were to be with him. Discipleship is not just studying the Bible. Discipleship is not just me communicating the word of God to you on a Sunday morning. Discipleship is doing life with each other, accompanying one another. And he would send them out to preach. Not only is discipleship a communicating, a teaching, but discipleship is when you teach them, you show them, and you send them. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's teaching them on the mountain. He's showing them teaching because he's teaching them adequately. And then what does he do? He sends them out to preach. In this one verse, maybe two verses, this one verse, one verse. That's exactly what it is. He embodies the teach, show, sin. Now let's go to verse 15 giving them authority to cast out demons. So this is what he's been showing them up to this point is preaching and casting out demons. So he teaches them, he shows them, and then he sends them to do the same. Now, I'm sure they didn't feel ready, right? I'm sure they're in their hearts, they're like, oh, but Jesus, I'm not ready for that. But he gave them the authority and he gave them the opportunity. There's learning curves. Discipleship, what I want to point out with this verse, is both relational and missional. When it says that they were to accompany him, they were to do life with him, it's very relational. It's very missional, mission-minded. Not to repeat myself from last week, but if you take your eye off the ball or you swing, you're going to miss. Right. Stay mission-minded. Stay focused. Now, I want to go back to the seed and the sower as we wrap up. A disciple of Jesus will be fruitful. They will produce a harvest. What I want to point out about this passage now is, you know, the seeds were all the same, but the condition of the soil was different. And one soil, to remind you, it was thrown on shallow soil and the birds came and ate the seeds. As Jesus explained, it's the devil that came to ate the seeds, just pluck it away. The other soil, it was, it was shallow, it was rocky. It never really had a chance to really get its, its roots firmly planted. And then the sun, the heat, the harmful things of this world, the heat of this world just dried it up, withered it away. The third group of individuals are those who receive the, the good news of joy. 
And then as they are being raised up, the thorns choke them out in the fourth fertile soil. Again, it's all, the seeds are all the same, but the condition of the soil is all different. The fourth one is the one that produced a harvest. At Highland City Church, we have these things called impact groups. They're small groups, small discipleship groups. And last week, I defined discipleship as the intentional process of becoming like Christ, both in character and conduct, in a small group context. Because that's exactly what Jesus did with discipleship. And what we do at Highland City Church, these small groups, it is to protect you from the snares of the devil. These small groups are meant to make sure that the rocks are out of the soil. These small groups are meant to make sure that the thorns aren't in place to choke you out. These small groups are meant to produce in you the fertile soil that allows for harvest to grow. I wholeheartedly believe that the reason that we have those three prior soils that, that ultimately don't grow is because people do not get plugged in to an impact group, a discipleship group, a small group that is dedicated to becoming like Christ with character and conduct. I wholeheartedly believe that. And so each and every one of us that are in this room, and I'm looking around trying to look at every single individual person, you are called to be a disciple of Jesus. And not only that, you are going to produce a harvest. The question is, and I'm I'm not ignorant enough to think this, if that's true, which I believe Jesus' words are true, that there are people that immediately receive the word with joy, and then they grow up, and then the thorns of this world choke them out. I'm not ignorant enough to think that that's not going to happen here with people in this very room. And if the role of an impact group, a discipleship group, is to make sure to protect the seeds so that the thorns can't choke them out, then you are robbing yourself of the opportunity to grow and produce a harvest simply by not joining an impact group, a discipleship group. And so I want to invite every single one of you to join it because it's not just what we're trying to do at Highland City, but it is genuinely the mission of Jesus. I had, oh, I I forget their names, Ashton, Ashley. And uh, so they came up to me right before service and they gave me this sticker. And it says, go and make disciples of all nations. And it's got pictures of of the globe. I said, I'm putting that on my computer right now. And, uh, but they, they get it. They get the mission. Praise God. Yet some of us don't. So anyways, I want to invite you to join an impact group. Something interesting about all of this. uh, Our goal in discipleship is not just knowledge. It's fruitfulness. We are to produce the fruits of the Spirit. We are to produce a harvest. Studying the Bible is great. But if you don't apply it, then what's the point? Studying the Bible deepens your faith, but it's in the application beyond these walls where faith truly comes alive. We're not meant to keep it here. We're meant to go. I want to point this last thing out, and we'll close. Jesus did not die for you it's just so that you could live the way that you want. Oh, yeah. Jesus died for you so that he could live in you and through you. So don't rob him of that. When you leave today, be the hands and feet of Jesus. Jesus saw how wretched we were in our sin, and he said, they can't save themselves. He can't save himself. She can't save himself. Only I can save him. So he manifests in the flesh, as 1 Timothy chapter 3 talks about. God manifests in the flesh. And as Corinthians says, he became sin so that we could know no sin. In other words, he bore the sin on the cross that we deserved so that we could be made right in God's sight. And the reason I'm so passionate about discipleship and just my faith in general is because why should I not be? Why, Why is there anybody that's not passionate about this? He died so that I could live for him not so that I can live in however I want to live. So I want to encourage each and every one of you to be discipled, to make disciples, and to follow Jesus, to love God, love others, and make disciples. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord. I'm so grateful for the opportunity of faith you've given us. Lord, this discipleship message, it truly is the command that you gave us. One of your last commands before ascending into heaven was to go and make disciples of all nations. And Lord, what that means is that we should make disciples in our context as we go to the grocery store, as we go to the gym, as we go about our daily lives. Lord, help us to glorify you in all that we do, making disciples along the way. Lord, help us to produce fruit. As we are together, as Hebrews talks about, we should stir up one another to encourage one another in love. 
and grace and truth, Lord, I pray that we can hold each other accountable so that we can remove the thorns from each other's lives, that we can remove the, the rocks from the soil, that we can protect each other from the snare of the devil, from the birds that fly to steal the seed. Lord, help us to protect one another. Help the disciple makers that are in this room that eventually will be. Lord, help them to protect their disciples. Help them to grow and draw near to you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And it's by your grace, Lord, that I petition these things. In Jesus' name, amen.